So that's a uh, sort of basic uh, function. And so now let's get into discussion of the disease questions that uh, kind of illustrate the, the key principles of function. Um, and so we'll focus on three relating to cells, wiring, and synaptic terminals, three classes of disorder. The first one is uh, amyotrophic lateral uh, sclerosis, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, Hawking, a famous uh, sufferer of, of that disorder. And uh, this uh, highlights this upper motor neuron versus lower motor neuron distinction. The upper motor neurons live in the brain and project down to the spinal cord where they make synapses on cells that live in the spinal cord but then project out to uh, the uh, body. And the upper motor neurons and the lower, mo lower motor neurons uh, are altered in different disease states. Uh, ALS happens to affect both, but it's best known for affecting the, uh, uh, the lower motor neurons, those that live in the spine and project to uh, muscle. Um, but it's, it's interesting because there are, you know, Stephen Hawking, for example, is a good example. There are upper motor neurons that affect the facial musculature and the regulation of affect or the appearance of emotion. And those are also altered in ALS. They can create sort of these syndromes of inappropriate smiling or even laughter uh, that are not really uh, reporting a true subjective state but are dysregulated activity uh, of upper motor neurons. Lower motor neurons also are dysregulated. They're both weak and inappropriately active. And uh, that is illustrated here. You end up getting uh, diseased or defective uh, spinal neurons. They start to lose uh, their uh, efficacy of connection with the muscle. They withdraw and pull back uh, some of the uh, 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 presynaptic terminals. You also get loss of upper motor neurons as well. Um, Early signs include uh, fibrillations. These are um, sort of uh, rapid pulsatile contractions of small muscles. You can experience those in upper uh, limbs, lower limbs, or, or eyelids. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and so those early signs of fibrillations are, are due to the fact that the um, the muscles themselves, in many cases, are becoming hyperactive. If you withdraw the innervation of a muscle, it's not getting its normal directed or controlled uh, uh, stimulation. And so what muscles do is they tend to uh, increase their activity level, increase the expression of acetylcholine receptors, increase their excitability, so much so uh, as, almost as if they're looking for something to be active in, some situating situation to be active in, that they start to spontaneously become active and, and fibrillate. Uh, but also you get less effective directed or, or, or CNS driven control. Uh, and so you get a, a weakness and an uncoordination. Um, and that, as it becomes progressive, leads to even difficulty breathing and ultimately uh, cases death. By the way, this voluntary control of facial expression I mentioned earlier, that's called pseudobulbar uh, palsy. The uh, causes are not fully understood. Uh, it's mostly a spontaneous disease. It can happen to anybody. Uh, is it a virus? Is it a toxin? Is it an exposure to heavy metal autoimmune? We don't know. It's mostly sporadic. There are familial cases, though, and they've given us uh, some insight. 20% of all familial cases, which are a tiny fraction of the overall, are due to deficiencies in the superoxide dismutase gene. And this is a gene that helps uh, effectively detoxify uh, oxygen radicals, superoxides, that can be damaging or toxic to DNA and proteins. Now, what's interesting is that neural activity itself can elevate these superoxides. It can elevate uh, uh, the redox potential of cells. You can end up creating oxidative damage just through high levels of activity. And this is uh, perhaps understandable. The very fact that a cell is highly active means you've got a lot of um, metabolism that's going on. You've got to keep restoring your gradients with the ATPases, for example, uh, and so you've got to pump all the ions back out. Also, some uh, uh, ions, particularly uh, calcium ions that come into cells, can be uh, a, a toxic as well and can lead to uh, oxidative damage uh, through indirect mechanisms. So maybe there's an elevated activity level 
that leads to toxicity. And supporting that, uh, there are medications that are used for ALS that involve blocking uh, certain kinds of glutamate receptors, like the NMDA receptor that we'll get to uh, in a minute. That's a, a great question. Yes, you can see spontaneous, uh, non-familial but sporadic mutations of this gene, but you also see uh, many other mutations as well. But it, it, then it's a tiny minority. It's in fact, we don't know most of the causes for sporadic. So uh, the NMDA receptor is a glutamate receptor. It's a it's a synaptic receptor like the acetylcholine receptor that's on muscle, except the, these glutamate receptors are on neurons. And they receive glutamate as a neurotransmitter, and they open much like the acetylcholine receptor. They allow sodium to come in, and they allow potassium to leave. But they have this additional calcium permeability, which the acetylcholine receptor doesn't have. They let calcium come into cells. And that heightens the metabolic demand on the cell. The cell now has to pump out all this calcium as well, and calcium itself can be toxic in some ways. And so some of the therapies for ALS, which are not great, only have a tiny effect on the clinical course, uh, are blockers of the NMDA receptor. Yohan Barre, this is a pretty interesting one. This is a reversible demyelination of peripheral nerves. Okay, it's really a fascinating, terrifying course initially. Uh, you get someone coming in who uh, has rapidly gotten weaker, maybe even having trouble breathing. Uh, looks like everything's uh, just uh, spiraling into disaster. Uh, typically follows a bacterial infection. And what's thought to happen is that the immune system is fooled into attacking myelin because there's a molecular mimicry. There's something on the myelin that looks like something that was on the bacterium. Uh, for example, it's lipopolysaccharides, components of its uh, coating. And immune cells, which we'll get into in more detail, uh, become fooled and end up making, uh, for example, antibodies that attack uh, neurons and attack uh, 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 myelin more particularly. In fact, it's the Schwann cell that's the more typical target. You end up with loss of myelin due to damage to the Schwann cell. Um, the neuron is under attack in some indirect sense. It's no longer able to conduct its uh, action potential effectively. But what's great about this disorder is the neuron's not dead. It's not even in itself damaged, and if, if there's a supportive care given, and these patients can, in some cases, require mechanical ventilation uh, to allow them to continue breathing. But eventually, uh, this immune system flare-up dies down, myelin is recreated, the Schwann cell re-insulates the peripheral nerves, and everything goes completely back to normal, which is amazing. Uh, sometimes you can accelerate the recovery by infusing what's called IVIG. This is uh, just a a very dense cocktail of human antibodies or immunoglobulins, which might help uh, effectively uh, distract or saturate this immune system attack uh, uh, away from the antibodies that are stuck to the uh, myelin or the Schwann cell. So that's a pretty interesting one. Nice, but re uh, you know, serious but reversible. Uh, some of the more difficult ones include uh, myasthenia gravis, which is a disorder of the neuromuscular junction. Pretty rare, uh, uh, but in aggregate, there's probably 30 to 40,000 people in the U.S. who have this. And it starts with uh, a uh, sort of a specific muscle weakness that patients report on, usually uh, in the uh, ocular uh, muscles, eyelids, or the muscles that control eye motion. So you can end up getting double vision or, or drooping eyelids. And this also is an autoimmune disease. It's caused by antibodies against uh, the postsynaptic acetylcholine receptor. For some reason, the immune system starts making antibodies that attack this postsynaptic receptor. And that has a number of effects. Uh, you can, therefore, uh, inhibit the ability of the acetylcholine receptors to respond to acetylcholine to open, and uh, you end up with muscle weakness as a result. The presynaptic terminal is perfectly fine. Acetylcholine is being released, but you're having a reduced response. And you can look for antibodies against the receptor. Uh, there are uh, uh, standardized uh, now methods for measuring uh, immunoreactivity from the patient's serum against uh, the acetylcholine receptor. And you can treat that uh, for acute flare-ups with pyridostigmines. Uh, these block the acetylcholine esterase, the enzyme that lives in the synaptic cleft and breaks down acetylcholine. And so you end up having stronger and longer 
uh, pulses of acetylcholine, which helps to partially uh, compensate for the fact that you've got a uh, partially inactivated uh, population of acetylcholine receptors. Um, also, addressing the immune system with steroid immunosuppressants can be helpful as well. Yeah, it actually could. Um, uh, I don't know off the top of my head if that's widely used. Any of our other folks know uh, if IVIG is used for myasthenia? The reason it's, it's used for Guillain-Barre is that's such a, a life-threatening thing. Myasthenia gravis is, is uh, uh, you know, in the, in the long run can be quite debilitating, but you don't have these acute life-threatening uh, uh, issues. Um, and IVIG comes with its own side effects. You can have a reaction to the IVIG, for example. But it's a, it's a great thought. It, it, it definitely is worth trying. The flip side of, of myasthenia gravis is Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome. Um, and this is when antibodies to the presynaptic terminal are uh, generated, again, for often mysterious reasons. Um, but often not. Sometimes you can trace it to a particular cause, which I'll tell you about in a moment. But the voltage-gated calcium channels that I mentioned that live in the presynaptic terminal and open to allow calcium in and allow vesicle fusion, uh, they can fall under attack by antibodies. Um, so the postsynaptic membrane is fine. It's the presynaptic membrane that's impaired. And you have reduced uh, acetylcholine release. Here, uh, you tend to have more diffuse muscle weakness. Patients complain of fatigue, uh, malaise, uh, dry mouth. Uh, there can be autonomic dysfunction, like uh, impotence or other uh, uh, sort of autonomic uh, processes, as well as voluntary muscle control. And again, you test this by looking in the serum for antibodies against voltage-gated calcium channels. Now, uh, about half of the patients will have an underlying cancer that was not previously known. Amazing thing. So what's going on there? Why does that happen? Well, some of these cancers may end up, for a variety of reasons, expressing or making abnormal proteins. That's certainly a feature of cancers, that they uh, will ex uh, have dysregulated transcriptional uh, uh, expression of genes, some that are useful for the cancer to propagate and so are selected for as cancers develop and evolve. And voltage-gated calcium channels are important in proliferation and in differentiation. And you can get abnormal expression of voltage-gated calcium channels in some cancers, particularly these small cell lung cancers. And so then, even though the immune system um, normally uh, it does not attack these native voltage-gated calcium channels, now it's seeing them in a new context, in the setting of uh, an invasive, tissue disruptive process, and that can end up triggering uh, the immune system to attack the voltage-gated calcium channels, which is then bad for your pre -synaptic. Yes, yes. So this is uh, absolutely the case. If you can eradicate the cancer, uh, then the symptoms go away. Uh, along uh, the path, though, to finding the cancer and taking it out, you'll want to ameliorate the symptoms. And so one interesting thing you can do is block potassium channels. Now, potassium channels, if you remember, they bring the membrane potential back at the end of each action potential. If you impair their function, then you've got a longer action potential. Action potentials are broadened, which means more opportunity for calcium to come in through those channels that are still present or are active. Uh, and that ends up uh, uh, reducing some of the symptoms. In, Okay, so different steps along the pathway, you get these very characteristic diseases. Um, it helps us understand the uh, core function of these structures.